All right. All right, here's a great question. We're starting off with a good question here. And this is always such a fucking hot topic. And I've done some uh, videos on this recently, as you guys know. Um, so I'm Jack, I'm Jazz Fiddle, uh, asks, how does someone end up in a relationship with a narcissist? <clears throat> it's a great question. The truth is, and it's not a pleasant one, uh, but we end up in a relationship with a narcissist uh, because we've been conditioned to allow someone to take advantage of. So you're walking in preconditioned. It's not because of you. You're not causing it to happen. So before anyone jumps on the, oh, fucking, you're blaming the victim. It's not that. Please understand it's a more complex equation than that. That if you have a childhood, and it can even be a great childhood. I came from a really good home, but part of the conditioning in our home, partly because of the religion, um, but you know, my parents were the good kind of religious, they didn't force anything or whatever. And they gave the example of, or they lived the example of always giving, giving, giving and being kind and looking out for others and so on and so forth. Well, if you walk into, if that's your mentality and you walk into a relationship, let's say in your twenties, just randomly into your twenties and you're used to giving, if you are walking into a relationship with someone who may even be a good person, but this person has their own stuff that they've been preconditioned to believe. Let's say they grew up in a home where they didn't get enough love. Not even that there was abuse. They just didn't get a lot of love or didn't get a lot of attention. Or they were taught that, hey, be quiet. You know, children are to be seen or not heard or any number of messages. Then if they've got someone finally pouring love into their love cup, they want more. And if you've been, like I was, if you've been conditioned to give and give and give, because that's just what we do, then all of a sudden we're setting up an imbalance in the relationship, aren't we? We're setting up an imbalance where someone is giving and the other person starts taking. And this person is happy to give more because they've not been conditioned to sort of expect that I be treated well as well. And that I, re I need to receive, hey, there needs to be a balance here, dude, or you know, miss, whatever. And so it sort of sets up this imbalance where I'm giving, 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 this person's happy to take, take, take. And then that imbalance widens over time and it create, can create uh, or, or foster or feed an existing need for more, for more, for more. So uh, narcissists can be, can allow themselves to, or people can allow themselves to turn into a narcissist, but we end up in relationships with narcissists if we have been preconditioned to believe that I have to give more, I need to give more, or you won't love me, or you'll walk away, or if I've been preconditioned to believe I don't matter, you're the one that matters. And this is why so much of my work, for instance, in my book, right, and in my podcast and shit like that, this is why so much of my work is about core beliefs. That healing the soul for a, a lot of healers and a lot of therapists and, and writers and stuff like that is focused on getting out the pain and getting out the fears. And, and I am all for that. However, there's another element and that's what I deal with in my book that a lot of others don't. And that's identifying the core beliefs that are driving you because it is those core beliefs that you can't even see. Okay, the things that you were conditioned to believe about yourself, not the things that were told to you, not just those things, but the underlying messages in what was told to you, the underlying messages in what wasn't said, the underlying messages or the message behind the message. As my mother who did this shit for, you know, 65 years, whatever, and, you know, died in her 90s. She did this long before I did. And she always used to say, Sven, always look for the message behind the message. I always help people identify the message behind the message that they got when they were children because we can't see it for ourselves in most cases. So how do, how do we end up in relationships with narcissists? We were preconditioned to believe that this is what we deserve. We've been preconditioned to give. We've been preconditioned to live in fear that if I'm not meeting every one of your needs and making you the center of the universe, you'll leave. And so we're preconditioned to fear. We're preconditioned to not mattering. All of these belief systems drive us into situations where all of a sudden we're getting our ass handed to us. All right, next question. All right. Uh, uh, oh, okay. What have we got? All right. Uh, Darius says, jumping on the coffee table is wrong. Don't know what that means. All right. Uh, I'm sure you mean well. I just don't know what that means. All right. Uh, Heather Ann says, you can't see the forest when you're standing in the middle of it. That's right. And... Yeah, we'll just let that one go. All right. Um, just another messenger asked this question. Uh, can you clarify the meaning of gaslighting? Yeah, but 
Gaslighting for me is like a uh, narcissist or love bombing. These are all terms, ideas thrown around a lot and they've become extraordinarily popular. Now the movie, you know, Gaslight existed, you know, whatever, 70 years ago, right? So that's been around, but this notion of it becoming like this popular phenomenon where everybody uses the fucking term is so fucking new. <laughs> 20 years ago, back in the 2000s, 2008, I don't remember anybody using that fucking term. I mean, in the rarest case, now everybody uses it. What is it? Well, first of all, go back and watch that classic movie, Gaslight, and it'll explain it, right? Um, but basically it is where somebody is basically trying to convince you that what you see is not true, what you're experiencing is not true, where they're blaming you for everything, where they are destroying your relationship with your own experience of reality. They're destroying, undermining your relationship with your own sense of self, your own instincts, but your own eyes, that what you see isn't true, what you hear isn't true, that what happened didn't really happen. It's where they're trying to control your reality. And the worst kind of gaslighting isn't the gaslighting that happens in love relationships. Even though that's where you're going to hear people talk about it most. The worst kind of gaslighting is when parents gaslight children. Small children, medium children, teenagers, or adult children. Where they say, no, that didn't happen. You want to fuck up a kid? Teach them that what they're experiencing inside, their feelings, or their experience of a situation isn't real. All right? I had a client, for instance... Uh, who, you know, he's in his 30s, 40s. This was many years ago. And uh, he recalls a story of when, you know, he and his father went, uh, went back to the country that the father had immigrated from, uh, emigrated from. And, uh, and they went back and when, the, when the boy was young. And the father tells the story that, oh, you had a great time. You know, you had a wonderful time. You, you were happy to see your old, your cousins that you had never met. And we went to, you know, the amusement park and all this stuff. And uh, yet the, the now adult son in his 30s, 40s, whatever the hell it was, 30s, I think, he said, Sven, I hated that fucking trip. And I said, why is that? He says, all I remember is that it was scary. There was a mean dog that they had chained up outside and they had, because they lived in a city, there were bars on the windows, which is common in some you know, big cities. But it was scary for me as a little six-year-old boy. And, you know, plus one of my, you know, second uncles or dad's cousin or whatever, you know, he was a big guy and, you know, he had tattoos and it was just, I was scared the whole time. And I said, well, your father says, you know, you had a great time. He says, yeah, maybe once or twice, you know, I was having fun, but deep, deep inside I had misery. So this kid's whole life, his father was telling him, no, that didn't happen. No, you had a great time. No, no you had a great time. And guess what? A child will believe a parent over their own reality. So now that child comes into teens, 20s, 30s, and they don't know what reality is. They have no relationship with their own self. You, you encourage them to trust their God or act on their own instinct. They don't know how. They have such distrust for their own self. They don't know what's really happening. And one of the other things that happens is that this is one way that a childhood becomes whitewashed because you don't even know what happened. You have some story going on inside of you that was your experience. And then you have this other thing that got put in and they don't connect. And so the, the brain will shut down. It's the craziest fucking thing. And, and, um, and so the meaning of gaslighting is, uh, the original question was, what's the meaning of gaslighting? To convince someone else that their version of reality isn't reality. And the notion of, oh, there's only one version of reality. Yeah, okay, that's about as simplistic, naive fucking thinking. Um, but to do it to a child is profoundly debilitating for that child. And I've had clients who have had that, uh, had that experience where they became suicidal as a teenager um, or people who are terrified of taking any bold action in their careers and it destroys their relationships because they, they go into relationships where they're forever dependent upon the other person to tell them what reality is. And oftentimes the other person is happy to do it. And all of a sudden you find yourself in potentially a situation with a narcissist where it's all about them, which goes back to my previous question where somebody says, how do we end up in a relationship with a narcissist? How about if you gaslight a child, tell them what their reality is, tell them what they should feel versus what they actually do feel. The kid's crying and you say, oh, you know, it's, it's okay. You need to stop crying. Stop crying. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Yet the child is clearly experiencing it as a bad thing. Deprive the child of their own experience of reality. Yeah, you're going to end up with some serious fucking problems for that kid later. All right, next question. I hope you guys are having a happy day. Because um, <coughs> I am. I had a workout this morning, just a quickie. And normally I don't do quickies, but <coughs> I got this fucking cold. Anyway, 
Um, yeah, Mandy follows up by saying, which leads to gaslighting of self. Um, and she says, uh, self-love journaling and talk therapy has helped me. Absolutely. And again, that's what my book is for, to help you get all that shit out and help you begin to find your own voice. Because uh, happiness is only going to come from an authentic life, a life that's integrated, that who I am on the inside, I am now living out on the outside. But very often we're living out this persona, this who, the person we had to be in order to either get approval or avoid criticism. So I'm living something on the outside and I'm, be, and I'm authentically or I'm actually someone else on the inside. And some people say, I don't even fucking know who I am on the inside, Sven. All they are experiencing is a disconnect between what I'm living and what's going on inside of me. And that disconnect will lead to depression, it'll lead to anxiety, it'll lead to all manner of fucking problems. All right, next question. Uh, huh. Well, thanks for saying so, Nate. Appreciate it. And he says, you know, this current discussion is resonating. Appreciate that. All right. What have you got, fine humans? Oh, wow. <laughs> Jennifer Jean Higuera asked a question. I see this a lot. And my parents uh, both passed in their 90s. Uh, Dad had Alzheimer's. But the Alzheimer's really affected his body more than his brain. Um, and he had been this vigorous... Uh, vigorous man, uh, far more energy than me or my son or my daughter. Had. Just this incredibly vigorous man growing up on the farm during the Great Depression and World War II. My mom, incredibly vigorous. She grew up on a farm as well. And uh, dad ended up becoming a pastor and blah, blah, blah. And mom had a very successful career and taught at the graduate level. Uh, but, and so it was much more, the Alzheimer's was much more vivid in the, the degeneration of his body, the slowing of his body. Cause he had, you know, and, and the effect on his brain was less so, but getting back to sort of this question, what about a, what about a controlling elderly disabled mother in adulthood, your adulthood that you're trying to take care of? All right. So I'm setting up, I believe I'm understanding Jennifer's question. Jennifer is saying, listen, my mom is fucking controlling as fuck, but she's also disabled. And now I'm an adult and she's much older and I have to fucking take care of her. Oh yeah, you want to talk about a match made in hell. Oh my gosh. First of all, having to take care of a family member in old age or if they're going through something is a profound, uh, it's love, but it's also a profound drain, can be a profound physical and emotional drain mental drain, financial drain on the person doing the work. We had to put my father into a nursing home just because mom couldn't take care of him anymore. And uh, the six of us siblings, uh, particularly the ones that were living in uh, Minneapolis at the time, you know, made the decision that, you know, mom, we can't do this to mom. And, but it broke dad's heart, but he understood. And, you know, he was that old generation, you know, tough it out. So you're asking, you know, what about that, that situation where the, uh, the, your mother is controlling? And you're trying to take care of her. It's unfortunately, unfortunately, when we're taking care of someone who doesn't have the capacity to take care of themselves, it's not always a democracy, even if we try to make it be a democracy. Sometimes it's like caring for a child. The child doesn't get to say whether or not they're going to a, the doctor if you know the child has a broken arm or is having blurry vision. The parent has to step in, except now you're the parent. And this, uh, for your aging parent, except your mom is controlling, right? And so you're confronted with a real difficult situation of really what it is, is do you have the courage? I don't mean this in any insulting way. I just mean, do you have the courage to stand up to your mother and say no, despite her pushback? And, uh, but I'm guessing the bigger issue is your mom is just fucking exhausting beyond just the trying to take care of her, she's so fucking controlling, which may mean she's actually trying to control not just the care of her, but trying to control you, trying to control your family or whomever is staying, uh, is living under the same roof as her. And yeah, you gotta, I'll be very honest with you, to the degree you can, you have to stand up and keep saying no. And unfortunately, this should have changed. Your mother should have changed decades ago, but she didn't, obviously, right? And so now you've got her under your own roof and you may reach a point where you may need to put your mother into some sort of uh, care, uh, nursing home or some sort of care, or bring in some sort of uh, care worker if that's available. Because, you know, I mean, what, what do they teach lifeguards in lifeguard training? That when you swim out to save someone, the natural human reflex instinct is to push, uh, to try to gain leverage 
on the person trying to save them so that I can keep myself above water. In other words, the lifeguard knows that this person will drown me if I don't take control of the situation. If you're caring for someone and they are pulling you down under the water, so to speak, or ruining your family or ruining your marriage or ruining you, you have to take control of the situation. And unfortunately, heartbreakingly, sometimes difficult decisions have to be made. And I think you know what I mean in that case. Uh, she, you may have to bring in outside help or put her into some sort of home along that line. All right. Um, here we go. This is a good one. Big Dog Dancer says, how do you re reconnect with the disconnected parts of emotions internally? I feel fully disconnected. I'm going to read it to you one more time. Um, how do you reconnect with the disconnected parts of emotions internally? I feel fully disconnected. Really, this is at the heart of most of the problems that are going to come through in a live or uh, it's really cuts the quick of what I go into in my book and on my podcast, The Badass Counseling Show, which you haven't, if you haven't downloaded it and subscribed, it's totally free. Uh, but it's, I'm, I counsel people on the show. It's not an interview show. I counsel people and I do lives and take questions live. So if you haven't done that, I recommend it or, and the book. If you're trying to heal yourself, this is a powerful tool. And many of you have already said it in this feed. Um, not that I'm a particularly great writer. Um, and <laughs> I'm not, uh, but I brought myself out of a 12 year suicidal depression. I've got the eight inch, nine inch cuts up my arms to prove it. And I couldn't find a therapist to fucking really help me. And I had to do it myself. And so all of my tools work and I know they work because I've used them on me plus, you know, counseling clients for 30 years. So back to the question, how do you reconnect with the disconnected parts of emotions internally? I feel fully disconnected. The way we reconnect, it, here's the analogy. All right. And you guys have heard me use this one before, but I'm going to turn here. You can see the woods here. This is on my property. All right. And in the woods, you see all the leaves fall from all these fucking trees, right? Connecticut and New York, lower New York, a lot of trees in this area, right? And I'm right in the tri-state area. And so what happens in the fall when all those leaves fall and then the rain and then the snows of winter and the mud and all that mixes in and there's a pack. It, the, the leaves and the mud and the ice and the water, it all packs, right? If I were to go in there right now with a rake and pull up those rake, those leaves, you know exactly what would happen. I'd be pulling up wet leaves with dirt and grime and so forth. But underneath all of that pack of stuff are the little shoots. The little shoots of maybe a new little oak or the little shoots of uh, wild uh, daffodils or jonquils or uh, tulips the little flowers, the little plants that are trying to come up, but that pack is so thick, it can't come up. So when you say, how do you reconnect with the disconnected parts of emotions internally? I feel fully disconnected. You're fully disconnected because you have so much pack of all the negativity and all the pain and all the fears and all the bullshit beliefs you were taught about yourself, packed on top of your authentic self, packed on top of your emotions. You were conditioned at a very young age to shut your emotions down, I guarantee it, in one way or another. Even if you came from a good home, that can happen. And so all of that pack, a lifetime of pack is on top of it. So the way to reconnect with ourself, as I hold your hand and walk you through in the book, there's a hole in my love cup. The way to do that is to begin to get out the negative. It means to go into the very tidal wave, tidal wave of pain and fears and bullshit beliefs you've been taught about yourself that you've been running from your entire fucking life. It's to allow that stuff, to welcome it, to finally allow that stuff up because underneath all of that is the answer to everything. Underneath that is your authentic self. And you say, well, shit, Sven, I don't have, people will say, well, shit, Sven, I don't have any fucking memories from my childhood. You know, I, my brain is, uh, is blank or I don't have any painful memories from my past or, you know, or anything like that. And I, I hear that a lot and that's legit. I'm not disparaging that, uh, but I'm saying a lot of times if there's a lot of pain or if there's a lot of hurt or if there's a lot of negative messaging, the, the human brain, the child's brain will shut down as a protection mechanism. And the way we sort of puncture that is we begin with this morning. We begin with yesterday. We begin with last week. Begin with the most recent event where you were hurt, you were pissed off, you felt sad, uh, you were insulted, you were offended, where something, you were driving uh, your car and somebody cut you off and you're like, you fucking asshole. Really? Without your blink, you just cut right in there and I almost bumped it. Okay, that's anger right there. Start with that. Start with that. Excuse me. Or start with you were watching the latest movie and, you know, 
it made you sad. You were just watching it last night. It made you sad. All right, start there. Get out your fucking pen. Get out your fucking journal, piece of paper, and flush out what exactly happened and what did I feel in that moment. Because clearly you felt something when you got angry. Clearly you felt something when you got sad. When you dropped a tear, right? You felt it. Now identify it. What was it? What was going on inside of you? Start with the tiniest, simplest thing. If you don't have any memories from your childhood of pain, if you do, start there. Go back. But I'm saying if you don't have any, then start with this morning. Start with yesterday. Start with last week when your boss said, I'm kind of disappointed in your work recently, Steve. Start there. Because I guarantee that hurt, right? Something. You do have some measure of emotion. Start with where you have any measure of feeling and remove that tiny bit of pack from when that person cut you off. Start there. And then you'll remember something else from, oh shit, Tuesday. That's right. I got a call from my old boyfriend wondering what I'm doing and it stirred something up in me. Okay, identify. What did it stir up? And start writing. And why did it stir up? And is it fear or is it anger? What precisely am I feeling? Writing it out, writing it out, writing it out. And more will come and more will come. And eventually, you're sending the signal to yourself, I'm okay looking at this stuff. And okay looking at the pain and the fears and the bullshit beliefs that I've been running from the whole time. I'm ready. And it'll give you a little more and it'll give you a little more. A lot of people get stuck in my book on chapter one. Chapter motherfucking one. Some people get like done with the inter introduction. It's like, whoa, whoa, this is hardcore. I don't know if I'm ready for this. And then they'll close it. They'll put it away for a week or a month. And that's fine. You just go at your own speed. That's okay. But the end of chapter one in particular, <clears throat> because one of the things I ask you is, you know, start journaling on the single most traumatic event of your childhood. People are like, what the fuck is that? I don't know what the single most traumatic event is. Or I had so many. Where do I pick? So they don't know what to do. And I, I could have been clearer in that and should, and should have said, in addition to that, is just start with what you do remember, even if it's starting with yesterday. Start with what you do. Um, but I, you know me, I'm a little aggressive and it's just like, fucking get in there, man. Go for the biggest shit, right? Anyway, all right, next question. Oh, 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 I gotta take this one. Zaggle.media says, how do I get my parents to realize I'm a different person than them and my siblings? Zaggle. <laughs> I have lived it. I love this question so much because this, this hits uh, my past, my heart. I have a heart for you here, Zagel. Um, I have no idea if you're a they or a he or a she, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because we've all experienced it to some greater or lesser degree that we have the awareness that somehow, in some way, small, medium, or large, I am different from those from whom I spring right? Because no two people are identical in every situation. And so in one way or another, you become aware of your difference. Now, I grew up in a home where my difference was obvious from the beginning. I was the youngest of six kids, all boys. One was a girl, but she basically considered herself one of the boys. So I had five older brothers. By the time I came around, you know, my parents were 40 and I love that I had older parents. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. But there was allowance for my difference and it was even encouraged by my mother, but my sibling, a few of my siblings, and uh, in particular, my father who loved me, told me every single day, he loved me, hugged me every day, kissed me on the cheek every single day, uh, but he really didn't understand me the more I aged through my young years into teen years, and then especially in my 20s, he never understood. He always supported me. He was always encouraging and, and kind, but he didn't understand me. It was very difficult for him and for some of my siblings and for people around me and my first wife and all this shit. And uh, how do I get my parents to realize that I'm different? Your question, Zagel, is how do I get my parents to realize I'm a different person than them and my siblings? Well, I'm betting they already realize it, right? Isn't that really the problem? I'm willing to bet that you have expressed your differentness at different times and it has been met with criticism or pushback or that's not allowed here or we don't like that or what's that, right? Either that or you haven't expressed it at all and it's in you and you know it will be met with criticism, with scorn, with pushback, right? It's either one or the other. Either you have done it a bit and you've gotten the criticism or you know it will get the criticism. And you're wanting to get your parents to realize you're a different person than them and your siblings. But that's not what you really want. What you really want is not only for them to recognize that you're different from them, but to honor it, to accept. Right? You want to be accepted 
for your difference. And see, this is the thing, guys. This isn't just, for those of you listening on this one and thinking, well, that doesn't really apply to me, but it does. It applies to all of us, whether it be with parents or siblings or friends or lovers. This notion that if I, because sh- what we all really want in life, one of the things we all want that is part of the human condition is that we all, to some greater or lesser degree, desire to be seen for who we really are and to have the person stay. To be seen for who we really are and to have the person say, like in the movie Avatar, I see you. And they stay. We all long to be heard. We all long to be seen and and to be loved for who we are, to be accepted for who we are, to be approved of. And so your real fear is not that you want them to realize who you are, it's your real fear and your real longing is to have them really see who you really are and accept it and want it and be okay with it and embrace it. But the fear is if I show you who I really am, you may not love me. Now that's kind of an indicator of, uh, forgive me, I don't mean to be an asshole, but it's not the best parenting. The best parenting is when your child is, when the child is encouraged to be who they are and they are loved and they are accepted for their uniqueness rather than I want you to be who I want you to be, right? That old song by uh, the Commodores, right? Lionel Richie. Everybody wants me to be what they want me to be. I beg, stole, and I'm borrowed. Easy like Sunday morning, right? Easy like Sunday morning. Um, Everybody wants me to be what they want me to be. Um, And that's not really love. Love is when I want you to, love is, you know, you be you, and I love it, and I want to be there. And not love is I want you to be who I want you to be. Now, yes, in relationships, some compromises need to be made, but not compromise of essential self, right? Your non-negotiables, your deal breakers, who you authentically are. And so what you're really confronted with, and this is all of us in relationships, don't fucking tell me that you don't struggle presently. And I'm not just talking to you now, Zego Media. I'm talking to everyone, myself included. Don't fucking tell me in your relationships that you don't struggle with or you've never struggled with showing the other person who I really am. And that's the real issue. See, the, 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 the desire to be seen for who I really am and have the person still love me, have them still want to stay, have them still want to pour love into my love cup and I pour love into their love cup, that desire to be seen for who I really am and to be accepted for who I really am is predicated upon the hard part. And it's predicated upon, it is preceded by the precursor. The thing that must happen first is that I got to show them who I really am. Now that's the scary part, isn't it? That the only way you can be accepted for who you really are, to be seen and accepted for who you really are, the only way is that you have to show who you really are first. And that's the scary part, isn't it? (laughs) That's what separates the men from the boys, right? You have to have the courage to reveal your authentic self, particularly in relationships, what hurts, what I want. And, And as I talk about in my book, there's a hole in my love cup, As I talk about in the book, I say, you know, we so easily can stand up. It's almost easier to stand up for ourselves in the big stuff. You know, you're in a relationship. And and again, I'm still talking about parent or sibling relationships too, but I'm I'm extrapolating here to um, love relationships. And it's so easy to say, well, shit, should I take this job in San Diego, sweetheart? You know, we're living here in Boston. I'm just making this up. We're living in Boston. Should we, you know, take the job and start together in, in San Diego? Or should we take, should you accept the job in San Diego and we move there? The big decisions, we tend to stand up for what we want. Where we most easily compromise ourselves is in the medium and small decisions. You know, it's it's it, like Saturday night, tonight, in, in New York City area where I am. Uh, it's Saturday, all right? And so if my girlfriend and I uh, decide, oh, you know what? The uh, national championship uh, hockey game for NCAA is tonight and Minnesota Gophers are in at my home state. You know, I really would like to watch that. And she's like, you know, she's not a sports nut at all. And uh, she says, well, yeah, you know, let's do that. Cause she, you know, wants to be a good sport cause I support her and her stuff. And, and I'm thinking, well, she's given up, you know, she, I know she doesn't want to do this. So, well, where do you want to watch it, sweetheart? Or what would you like giving her the option to, even though I know I want to go down to sales bar and sit there and watch it and get loud and put on our jerseys and, you know, be obnoxious and watch some fucking hockey. Right. And she's like, well, you know, we could go have a drink or something, but I think it'd be better if we watch it at home. 
But if I don't ever express what I want, because, gee, I want her to be happy, right? Then we watch it at home. And, uh, you know, should we watch it in the living room or the family room or watch it in bed, you know? And it's like, oh, let's just watch it in bed. And uh, I'm like, okay. And, you know, we each get a cocktail or whatever and go lay in bed. And, you know, she's, she watches and stuff, but maybe falls asleep. And then, you know, before you know it, um, either she falls asleep or she loses interest or whatever. And I'm sitting there bitter. I'm sitting there bitter because I wanted to be in a bar and here I am in bed already. And it's the first fucking period of a three hour long hockey game. I've compromised myself because I didn't speak my wants. Okay. And it's so easy to compromise ourselves in those small and medium things. And at times it's necessary, right? But if I keep doing it, I keep doing, it. oh, it's no big deal. Oh, I'll give it up. Oh, it's, you know what? I'll make the best of it. Eventually we get down the road and we're making the best of everything, but this isn't what I actually want. Getting back to your question, you know, how do I get my parents to realize I'm a different person than them and my siblings? In any relationship, you have to have the courage to reveal yourself. You have to have the courage to put out there when someone has hurt your feelings. And this is a tough one, especially for guys, because we've been so conditioned, uh, at least in the US and Canada, we've been so conditioned, ah, you know, feelings don't matter. They do fucking matter. Because if you don't express when someone has hurt your feelings or when you're feeling upset, when it's small, what do we do as guys? And a lot of women too. What do we do? We wait till it gets big. Oh, that's no big deal. It's no big deal. But eventually then it gets so fucking big, this mountain of shit we've been denying that we fucking blow up, right? And why do we blow up then? Because it's only then that we feel justified expressing our feelings. It's only then that we can't keep it in anymore. But the problem is way back here in the fucking small shit that I have to be willing to reveal how I really feel and who I really am when it's small. Otherwise, it will metastasize. People, 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 small things become big things. Always. Problems don't just magically go away. They metastasize like a motherfucking cancer. So how do you get your parents to realize you're a different person? You start being you courageously and unapologetically, unrelentingly you. And they are either going to accept you or are they going to reject you? And they will, in all likelihood, the mere fact that you have this fear says that you know what their response is going to be. And you'd be a fool not to anticipate and expect that response to be what it is. And what you have to be willing to do if you are going to live a life of authenticity, whether it be with a parent, with siblings, with a lover, you have to be willing to lose that person. Willing to lose that person's love, willing to lose that person's approval, that person's acceptance, that person's acknowledgement of who you are, that person's acknowledgement of the pain they've caused you. You have to be willing to lose of ever getting an apology, for maybe for what they've done to you. You have to be willing to lose the affection that you count on from the lover, from the sibling, from the parent, from the friend. You have to be willing to lose that because until you are willing to lose that, you will forever compromise self. And that's when death begins in the immortal words of the absolutely and unequivocally iconic greatest solo rock artist of all time, Bob Dylan, fucking Nobel Prize winner and Minnesotan, if I may add, in his words, he not busy being born is busy dying. And being born takes courage. And in the words of Joseph Campbell, there is no birth without blood and the tearing of flesh. Literal birth or metaphorical birth, birth of the soul. If you are going to be yourself, you have to have the courage to go through the pain and there will be pain. If you have the courage to start being a different person, when so many people are expecting you to be the person you've always been, and they're gonna pressure you to be that person, and they're gonna be disappointed if you aren't the person, and they may even walk away from you if you aren't that person. If you don't have courage, you're never gonna make it past step one. And step one is just beginning to be who you really are. Step two, and you're gonna lose people. Step two is that you actually start to attract people. The more you become uh, authentic self, and reveal that and live integrated, that who you are on the outside is who you are on the inside, is a reflection of an integration of who you are on the inside. The more you do that, the more you will effortlessly begin to attract people who fall in love with who you're becoming. And they'll say, fuck, I love who you're becoming. Or they'll say, I love that you don't even know yet who you're becoming. I love that you have the courage to become. I love that you have the courage to slough off like a snakeskin. You have the courage to shed that which is no longer you. And people, you've heard me say it before, the path to becoming you requires discovering, the path to discovering who you are requires discovering who you're not. 
identifying what is not me and having the courage to say no. No is the, the most powerful and the most uh, clear statement of self because it's saying what I'm not. So if you want to become self, get reconnected to self, start identifying what doesn't feel right to you. Regardless of what people say you should do or should be, what feels right to you? It's beginning to trust your own feel. So to finalize this uh, on this question, Zagal Media, and it's a fucking great question. It really is, because it cuts to the heart of all this work. <coughs> How do I get my parents to realize I'm a different person than them and my siblings? Um, you, you get them to realize it just by being your authentic self, by being that different person. But that's not the question you're asking. You're asking, how do I get them to approve of me? You just be you. And either they're going to approve you or they aren't. And just for the record, one of the things that happens is the more we have the courage to be our original self or authentic self, in the short term, we lose people. But some of those people sometimes will come around later. But thinking, holy shit, fucking hawk, man. Oh, I got to keep those. I have little dogs, little Morkies. Now they flew into my neighbor's property. I've got my big dog out there watching my little dogs. Big, two hawks. I wish you guys could have seen them. Like wingspan, like, like that. And my two little fucking Morkies are out there. Oscar, come here. Tom, come here. Anyway, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, you got to have the courage to be you and it's going to take courage and you're going to lose people. They may come around later, but you have to have the courage. You have to have the courage to be your authentic self, knowing you're going to lose people, knowing there is going to be pain. And if you're not ready for that yet, that's okay. But the day is going to come when the pain of not being your authentic self gets so great that you're like, fuck it, I got to do it. And that's what I talk about in the book, the fuck it. You know, where I, I have a chapter where I talk about the fuck it point. The books, there's a hole in my love cup. The podcast is uh, The Badass Counseling Show and I do it yourself video courses on the website. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, Nachgesprach, Deutsche, uh, Mann. Uh, hi, psychotherapist from Germany here. I just love your content. Thanks for the work. Danke sehr. All right. All right. Michelle, I appreciate it. Go get my babies. Actually, Tom is right here and Oscar is sitting right over by my 95 pound Rhodesian Ridgeback. So that would take one ballsy hawk. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I'm good. All right. Thank you though. <laughs> all right all right um tracy 021526 asks how do you deal with an extreme taker aka narcissist as you people know most people call them narcissists i change the language to extreme taker because narcissist is just it's so fucking convoluted it's like using the word well whatever it doesn't matter uh anyway how do you deal with an extreme taker a narcissist when he doesn't believe he is one <laughs> how do you deal with all right you wouldn't use that language unless you were not enjoying it we deal with things that we don't enjoy or we deal with things that are problematic so your mere language indicates the level of um problem it's become right and it's at the point where you're asking me so in other words it's beyond uh, your ability to figure out up to this point. And I'm not disparaging you for that. That's fine. We all get into situations. The moment I put my head under the, root, the uh, hood of my car, <laughs> I'm in an overwhelmed situation. Like, okay, I don't know what I'm fucking doing. You know, I can add oil and maybe even change my oil, but beyond that, no. Um, so I get it. So I'm not disparaging you, but you're asking, how do I deal with an extreme taker? Deal with implies that you're going to continue to allow them to be the extreme taker. You ask, how do I deal with an extreme taker when he doesn't believe he is one? He doesn't, you don't, he doesn't need to identify as an extreme taker, as an narcissist in order for you to change. See, you're wanting him to change, right? So that your relationship can become better. You're wanting your narcissist to change so that you can get your needs met, right? I mean, otherwise, why would there be a necessity to change the person? You need them to change because they're fucking annoying or they're a taker or it's draining the fuck out of you or you're really not enjoying this relationship, right? Right. And so what really has to happen, the only shot you have of, uh, of changing 
the extreme taker, but really the only shot you have of changing your relationship, which is what you really want. It's not that you want to just fix this person for altruism stakes. You want to change them so that you'll get your needs met in the relationship, so that they'll treat you differently, so that you will get a feeling that you don't presently have. Feeling of feeling love, feeling trusted, feeling treated with respect, right? Right. That's what you really want. The only shot you have is that you have to change first. See, they're not going to fucking change. They're not going to fucking change unilaterally. There's no incentive. Why would they change if they're getting everything? If I'm an extreme taker and you're just giving and giving and giving, sure, you complain. Sure, you tell me you don't like it. Sure, the fuck do I care? You just keep giving. I just got to put up with some of the complaining. I can deny it, say there's nothing wrong with me, even though deep down the, the narcissist knows it. They know. And if you haven't uh, listened to my podcast from March 23rd, you need to listen to it because I had a, a, a self-admitted narcissist in the room uh, that I'm counseling and a narcissist survivor that I'm counseling simultaneously. So fucking insightful. Um, so how do you deal with it? You have to fucking change. They are not going to change until there is pain. And you may not even be able to conjure enough pain or you may not be able to do anything that will change them. I mean, read my comments on all my narcissist posts. Read the comments here. I guarantee there are already people commenting you can't change a narcissist. Now, the truth is you can Maybe, but it's a long shot because the only, you guys have read it in my book. You know what I believe. The change will not occur until the pain gets bad enough. And very often, so um, this person that was on the show, this gentleman that was on the show, the only reason he admitted to being a narcissist, the only reason he finally wanted to get real help and to the point of coming on my show and you know, I'm, you know, I'm pretty tough on folks and uh, not mean, just tough. And, uh, but the only reason he did it was she was just, his wife was like, I'm done. I'm so fucking done with you. I am out of here. And he didn't want to lose her. And he knew that he had been being basically an asshole since he was, I think he said eight or 10 or 12 years old. He knew it. He knew he was manipulating situations. He knew. And finally, the risk of losing her was so great that he decided to change. But the truth is that may not work for you. That for some narcissists, you threatening to leave, they don't fucking care. Fine. See ya. By the way, I'm going to take everything while you're going or whatever. Or they'll threaten you. I'll destroy you if you leave. They don't want you to leave. Why? Because they're getting you pouring all the love in a love cup and they don't have to do anything. Hell, they may be even cheating. Now they got two people pouring love in. Or maybe they're expecting your kids to pour love into the love cup. A real peach of a woman or a real peach of a man, right? They're having everyone, including the kids, pouring love into their love cup. Oh, yeah. The only shot you have of getting what you want to feel, which is happiness, right? Loved appreciated, respected, is for you to stand up at every single fucking turn and demand single fucking turn, which means you have to change. And if they don't, if you demand it and they don't do it, there have to be consequences, right? And at some point there has to be inside of you, there has to be the insistence that if this doesn't change, I'm gone. I just want to fucking be happy. And if you're not, if they're, if that is not inside of you, if you do not have that capacity, they're not going to, there's no chance of change, right? Because they have all the levers of power. They know you won't leave, right? And that's why, and I've done a video on this, and this is true of women, this is true of men, particularly of women, because of at least in the US and Canada, to the best of my understanding, the socialization of women is, uh, you know, you don't leave, <laughs> And you take it and you take it and you take it. But a, a superpower for any person in any sort of a relationship is when you're okay if they leave you or when you're okay if I have to walk away, then I'll still be okay. That's a fucking superpower because now you're not going to tolerate shit. But you have to change first. If you're ever going to have any hope of standing up for yourself at every single turn or potentially walking away, you have to change. You have to confront your own shit inside of you that's causing you to stay. You've been preconditioned to stay in this situation with this narcissist. And unless that preconditioning is brought up and identified and rooted out, like the pack that I was talking about earlier, the pack of the woods and the leaves packed on top of your authentic self, unless you get that out, you're not going to have the courage to follow through at every single turn. It will be a, it's, it's a massive drain of energy to stand up for yourself at every single turn when the person is just attacking and attacking and, and there's just this constant onslaught and there's this constant uh, slipping into old patterns. It's a massive drain of energy and it takes a massive amount of focus. And if you don't do it every turn, then you're going to uh, accept it at certain points and say no at other points. Now you're sending a mixed message. And just like my little guy, Tom, who's come over to say hello, who I would grab, but he's on the other side of my fence. Um, 
if I'm not consistent in my messaging to Tom, Tom will act erratically, right? It's the same way if you're dealing with a narcissist. So it takes a profound amount of energy and you're not gonna have the energy to stand up for yourself at every turn if you haven't done the self work on yourself of rooting out all the pain, the fears, and especially the bullshit beliefs you've been taught about yourself, particularly the bullshit belief you've been taught about yourself that says you aren't worth it, that says you're no good, that says you don't matter, that says your needs don't matter because that is what is undermining and that is what has undermined up till now you're standing up for yourself. All right, fine humans, what's next? <coughs> Uh, well, you know what? This dovetails right into it. BD Clev asks, do you have advice for learning to be disciplined as an adult when discipline was not taught young? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and and I know it's going to sound like there, there's no causation, no causality between the two things. But we are naturally disciplined and ha motivated to go after things that excite us, things that are fun to us, things that motivate us, that we feel passionate about. Hold on, I'm gonna see if I can grab Tom. Hold on, and I'll come back to this question, I promise. Tom, come here, come here, come here. Come on, come on, come on, ding dong. Oh, 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 that's a good boy. Oh, that's a good little monster. Oh, look what I found, guys. Look at what I found. I found a furry monster. Hi, Tom. Tom, will you help me with this question? Do you have advice for learning to be disciplined as an adult when discipline was not taught young? Yeah, the bottom line is, we are naturally disciplined. We naturally work harder. Have you ever been at work and you've had a project or a creative endeavor that you've been working on or something where you're just so excited about it that you forgot to eat at lunchtime or you just worked so fucking hard and you wanted to put in more time even though, you know, oh shit, it, you know, I gotta feed my kids or, you know, whatever. All right, that's discipline. That's natural discipline. We are naturally disciplined when we're going after that which excites our soul. Now, here comes Gunnar and Oscar. Um, we're naturally disciplined. So if you feel you don't have the discipline in your pursuits, whatever it may be, it's because you've been preconditioned to believe that you have to do things that you don't want to do. It means you're engaging in a life that doesn't light you up, that doesn't get you excited, right? So you have to remove those voices. You have to remove all the shoulds. My mother used to say back in the 70s, Sven, I, I'm not going to should on you. You let me know if I've should on you, right? It's sort of a cliche nowadays, but that back then it was quite clever. 40 years ago, 50 years ago. But you've got to remove those shoulds from inside of you. Those are the voices, those are the viruses infecting the operating system of who you are. And until those are out of you, you'll never have the discipline. And because the reason you don't have the discipline is because the things you're engaged in, the life path that you are on is not your own. Does that make sense? Oh, now fucking Gunner is whining. He always whines, Tom. He always whines. Tom's like 12, which means I don't know how many years we have left with this little fellow, but all right. <clears throat> um, all right, Gail Lee, this is a great question. Gunner, don't whine, okay? You've had so much food already today, you crazy beast. All right, so what's the suggestion for someone whose soul dances at the prospect of loving others? Well, the mere fact that you asked that question says there's a problem. Because if your soul strictly danced at the prospect of loving others and there was no um, um, counter um, voice inside of you, or there was no fallout or fee uh, negative feedback or negative repercussion, why would you even be presenting that as a question or as a problem? You ask the question, so what's the suggestion for someone whose soul dances at the prospect of loving others? Now, either there's a downside or you're implying that I'm saying there's a downside to loving others, and I am. So you can pin that on me. Fucking hell, Gunner. No. No. All right, that's a lesson, people. You gotta be willing to say no. He's gonna still fucking whine. All right, <clears throat> so which means, yeah. Um, anyway, <clears throat> what's the suggestion for someone who's soul danced at the prospect of loving others? I relate to that question because mine does. I love loving others. I was raised by parents who just love people, and gave their lives in service of people. So the suggestion is it's not enough to just love others because ultimately what you're doing is you're pouring out all the love out of your love cup. There's got to be an insistence on I need to fill my love cup too, which is why I'm about protecting my time and I'm very deliberate about protecting my physical space. I can only handle so much because so much of my life is spent counseling people or so much of my life is spent doing this shit for free, you know, for you guys or, 
or writing books or working with the homeless in my city or working with some you know veterans to a particular organization where I do some pro bono work and so because I spend so much of my life giving and pouring out of my love cup to others you know I have to be protective about my space and regenerating me and I know the things that regenerate me that breathe life back into my soul that refill my love cup furthermore back when I was going through the suicidal depression I have the scars up my arms that's why I'm showing you my forearm when I was going through that for 12 years and then subsequent to that and really since I was 13 when my mom started me journaling I've been flushing out my love cup and scouring that fucking thing you know like after you uh, broil a steak in your oven, you know, on the broiler and the broiler pan gets fucking caked with fucking grease and then you eat the fucking meal and then you go to clean that fucking pan. And yeah, you can scrape out some of it, some of it but anybody know who has a broiler pan or any sort of pan, that it gets those brown spots and those black spots and you really gotta scour the fuck out of that. You have to be deliberate and constantly scouring. Well, the soul is the same way. The love cup is the same way. If you're not deliberate about scouring the negative messaging and the bullshit beliefs you've been taught about yourself and old pains and old fears from the past, not just the present shit. The present shit is easy. That's why if you're going to counseling and all you're talking about is what happened this last week, you aren't getting into the real shit. You gotta scour that motherfucking pan. And if you ain't doing that, then that's the shit that's still being triggered by life, right? So what I'm getting at is, the original question was by Gail, what's the suggestion for someone whose soul dances at the prospect of loving others? Gail, you're, you're a kindred spirit. That's how I am. I love to give love to others, but I'm only able to do it, to do so much fucking pro bono work. And I'm only able to do it because I am deliberate about loving self because I have hard fucking boundaries. I have to say no more often than I can say yes, just because I don't have the energy sometimes. I can't get all to all the thousand direct messages a week that people send to me wanting advice, wanting questions. I try to get some, as many as I can, but I have to be able to say no. Why? Because I know what happens if I don't replenish my love cup. I know what happens if I don't take time alone. I know what happens if, let's say tonight, I had mentioned this earlier, if I don't watch the University of Minnesota Golden Gopher hockey team in the national championship, if I don't watch at least part of that game, it doesn't, they don't even have to win, though it, will, it sucks the life out of me when teams I like don't win, right? But even if they don't win, I know I need to do that. I know I need to shut off my fucking phone, shut off TikTok, shut off Instagram and, and Facebook and blah, 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 and just enjoy a fucking game. You know, probably get a little toasty, get a little loud, probably get really loud. You know me, I'm loud. Um, if I don't do that, I'm neglecting my soul. I'm going to have a house full of fucking Italians tomorrow for fucking Easter, right? I'm not Italian, but these fucking Italians, they know how to eat and they're loud and I love every last one of them, but I got to have me time in anticipation of that. I have to have me time, not just on the weekends, but during the week and, and where I'll get out on my bike and just ride for an hour or where I go to the gym and I just put my earbuds in and I left, lift heavy or I'm just sitting on my fucking fat ass in my backyard reading the Sunday New York Times tomorrow. I have things that I have to do to fill my love cup other than, because if I don't, then my soul that dances, to use your language, Gail, my soul that dances at the prospect of loving others, my soul will become depleted and dragged down. We call it in this industry, burnout, right? In any industry, in nursing, I was an emergency room chaplain uh, for some time and uh, the emergency room nurses, doctors too, but nurses, I just, I just love nurses. They're the greatest, they're the saltiest fucking people. Male and female nurses love them and non-binary nurses fucking love them to death. Um, but there's burnout in nursing, there's burnout in teaching, there's burnout in any industry where, or any life, even parenting, where you're pouring more out of your own love cup and you're not replenishing your love cup. And just as an aside with parenting, if you're using the child to refill your love cup, then you're using the child to get your own needs met. Don't do that. All right, next question. And I think I'm just gonna take one or two more, um, but um, I'm gonna send, send time. Oh, wait, 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 oh, here's one. Uh, Michelle, I wish you hadn't said that. Michelle says, you need to stop cursing so much. Um, any of you guys have any thoughts on that while I put Tom back? There you go, Tom. Look out, look out. All right, there you go, Tom. Oh, yes, oh, that's a good boy. That's a good boy. <coughs> uh, Michelle, uh, I get that a lot, and I, I respect that, uh, that you don't like the cursing, and that's, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. <coughs> <coughs> I'm a former clergyman. My father was a clergyman. 
my parents grew up in the 20s and 30s and, and so forth. I never got the message that uh, cursing is a sign of lack of intellect because that's just fucking dumb because some of the smartest people I know swear with flair and abandon. But there's just some people who don't like swearing and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The reason uh, you say I need to stop cursing so much, almost as if it's a command, but I'm reaching a different audience from a lot of people. I'm reaching people who prefer that. I'm, I'm speaking to people who, or even just tolerate it, but I'm speaking to people because there are people out there who live this way, who are sort of more like me. They, they're just real, they're raw, it's straight. It's just, there's just some of us in this world who are just different, we're raw. And I know that I could have a far greater audience if I didn't swear. And the truth is, this was, the, of all the books I've written, I've written nine books, like six or seven have been published. This is the first one where I didn't swear, right? The first one. And, and that was deliberate because I really wanted a lot of people to get that because that's an effective tool. Um, but all my other ones were in the field of spirituality and you know the decline of religion and shit. I'd swear in those. But I swear because A, I've just got a different audience, people that need to be reached who resonate with my language. But it's not even, if I'm really honest, it's not even that fucking thought out. I just swear, because this is who I am. If you are at my house, this is just how we talk. This is how my girlfriend talks. She grew up in a fucking Italian family in the fucking Bronx in the 1960s and 70s. <laughs> There's just some people in life that are different. And this is how I'm different. And it's okay if my message and my language does not resonate with you. You're not the only one. You're not alone, Michelle. There are plenty of people who say that. And that's okay. And I'm willing to have a smaller audience to just be me. I'm just doing me. Because honestly, I wouldn't be able to do this if I weren't just being me. I have to be authentic because that's what makes it fun. I have to just be me. And so I was talking a minute ago about you know how I have to be deliberate in filling my own cup in order to be able to give more to others rather than just sort of giving and giving. Well, the swearing is a great example of it. And I know it sounds silly. I know it sounds fucking stupid. But this is how I talk. And so me being me and what makes it fun for me in giving to others is doing it my fucking way. You know, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Um, so, so Michelle, if it doesn't work for you, I, I totally understand. And, but there are a lot of great therapists on TikTok who can help you who don't swear. In fact, most of them don't. There are some other ones that do. Probably want to stay away from those as well. But you're welcome to stay. You're welcome to go. Uh, but... I'm likely not going to stop because that's what makes it fun for me. All right. Mm, probably the last question, but I may do too. All right. Um, thank you, Carly Kay. It's, and that was kind of you to say to me. All right. Uh, hmm. Hold on. I'm trying to read this question. Just parse it out in my brain. Okay, um, Mike, I'm gonna take this and I may not be hitting the exact question that you have. Um, Mike uh, okay, Okazbeeg says, I feel so scary when I agree with people because of childhood trauma. And I bet you wanted to put a period right there and then you say, how do I overcome this? So I'm gonna read it and I, I might not be hitting the exact question you have and so forgive me on my uh, failure to comprehend. I feel so scary, I'm guessing you mean scared, when I agree with people because of childhood trauma. Yeah, okay. It feels scary when you're agreeing with someone when it's not coming from your authentic self but coming from that sort of preconditioned uh, childhood trauma, your, your conditioned responses because of that trauma in the past and you ask, how do you overcome that? That's actually a great question. How do I deal with trauma? Present trauma or pa especially past trauma? Because it's all that past trauma and it doesn't have to be something as, as massive as I was you know, beaten as a child or I was raped or I, and those are huge. But there are other forms of trauma and none, I, I don't like to get into comparing pain, right? Or you know, I don't, it just everybody has pain. And that will condition your response, it'll condition your career choices, it'll condition how you act in your love relationship, how you act in your friendships, how you interact with your family as an adult. And so the only way to change that is to get those traumas out of you and what that means. You guys heard me use this language before. Basically, you have experiences in your past. You have memories in your past. This is the memory. And each of your memories in your past that uh, you consider trauma, it, what trauma means is that there's an emotional charge attached to that memory, perhaps even multiple charges attached to that memory. You know how uh, uh, electrons spin around a nucleus? Do you remember that from chemistry, physics, fucking biology, right? 
It's that same thing. That you have a memory that there are emotional charges spinning around and, and attached to, basically. And in order to be free of that, and in order to no longer respond, remember, uh, Mike says, I feel so scared when I agree with people because of my childhood trauma. In other words, you're aware of it, which is great, because that means you're identifying, hey, I know my trauma, and I see how I'm responding because of that trauma. Great. What we have to do is go back to that memory. We have to stop running from those charged memories. Stop running from that pain, the fears, and the bullshit beliefs, that tidal wave of pain, fear, and bullshit beliefs you've been taught about yourself. Stop running. And you have to allow it to wash over you. You have to finally welcome. You have to finally open that vault and welcome and allow those memories that have the negative emotional charges. And so many people are like, I don't want to fucking do that. So many people would rather do anything, stay busy, take drugs, take pills, swipe and scroll, game incessantly, over-parent, over-exercise, overwork. They would rather do you know, gambling, cheating, anything, anything, rather than face all that shit from the past. And isn't it fascinating that a memory and the charge, the emotional charges attached to it, that a memory can be so terrifying that a person doesn't even want to sit alone in a room and it's understandable. I'm in no way disparaging that. That's how powerful, how fucking powerful these memories with their emotional charges are. We will spend an entire life adapting, creating ways to avoid it. That's how powerful that shit is that was done to you in childhood. The healing, the changed responses in your present and in your future. The change relationships, the change career, the sense of authenticity, to finally have peace in your soul. Do you know what that feels like? No, you don't because you've never had it because you've always had this unrest and all the messages you were conditioned to believe about yourself and all of that pain and the fears and the bullshit beliefs, all of that is in there. All of those emotional charges and so you have to pull up those memories and de-charge. The pain, the fears, and the bullshit beliefs, the underlying messages you were taught about yourself, decharge those memories such that then it just becomes a memory. Do you ever think of it? Think of it. What happened to you this week that had no emotional charge attached to it? I can think of something. Um, I walked out of the green grocer and I remember walking to my car and opening the door, putting the groceries in the back seat. Uh, and getting into the car. I remember it. It was uh, fuck Thursday or something. I had to get some groceries and some limes for gin and tonics for last night. <clears throat> There's no emotional charge attached to that memory. It's just fucking memory of walking to the car. For whatever reason, it's stuck in my head. And maybe it's because earlier in the week, I was sitting in my car at the same green grocer and the woman next to me pulls up. She opens her door, bonk. I literally, I'm sitting in my car. I hear it bonk against my car. And I got out and I said, ma'am, um, you can't do that. She said, and she said, what? I said, you just hit my car with your door. She says, well, it wasn't very hard. I said, ma'am, you can't do that at all. That's not okay. She says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so I said, it's okay. It's all right. Just can't do that. So I remember that. So maybe that's why I remember walking out of the grocery store when there was no event at the green grocer, right? Well, that's what it is. And that can happen with those traumatic events from your past, whether it be yesterday, last week, or 42 years ago when you were six. It can be that. Right now, it's charged. Those memories are charged. There's an emotional charge attached to it. And you can decharge that such that it just becomes a memory with no charge that you're no longer running from. And so then the obvious question is how? And I, I don't mean to do a shameless plug, whatever, whatever, but I believe in the tool. This is 80% of my counseling method in one place. This is 80% of my counseling method, right? And I also have do-it-yourself video courses on the website, but my book, there's a hole in my love cup, and those video courses, a lot of it encapsulates the book. You can counsel with me, you can use this. Fuck, you don't have to buy a fucking thing. Don't even buy a thing. Just use every single one of my videos on TikTok, on Instagram, whatever. Use my free podcast. There's a whole, um, the Badass Counseling Show. It's free. It's on Spotify and Audible and Apple Music and blah, blah, blah. And use those as journaling prompts. Get a fucking pen and a pad of paper and start journaling out, flushing out all of those memories and the emotional charges attached to them and don't stop. And in my book, I give other tools that I don't even, I, I recommend. You guys have heard me say it before on page four. No, nope, five, no, nope, six. Go on to uh, Amazon, look inside the book. And on page six, five or six, it's not even a numbered page yet. I have a suggested reading list. 
Now, normally an author puts a suggested reading list at the end of a book. I put it at the beginning. Why? So that anybody could go onto Amazon and read these, uh, this list of books. None of them are mine. All of these are extraordinarily powerful books, extraordinarily powerful tools to help you heal. And I literally say, you don't even, even if you never finish my book or never read my book, there's so much wisdom in these other books. Just go get these other books. I won't make a fucking penny. I don't give a shit. But if you do the work, now does my book have something that those don't? Yes, I believe it is. And that's where I get into those core beliefs and helping you identify them. But there are tools out there, if you do the work, of going back and welcoming, rather than stuffing them down anymore, but welcoming those memories and their emotional charges and do the work of decharging them, you can finally have peace in here, up here. And you can finally feel a sense of aliveness because that's you taking out from where I started the very first question today. That's you removing the pack of leaves and crud and rain and snow from the winter in the forest. It's you removing all of that crud from your past. And then those, just like in the woods where the tulips and the jonquils and the daffodils all just naturally spring up then. The same thing happens. If all you have to do is remove the raw sewage, as I talk about in the book, Decharge those memories and your authentic self, your real self, will effortlessly rise up. And you will know an aliveness. You will know a vigor. Literally, you will feel lighter and lighter and lighter. The more you, you get it, you'll have more spontaneous physical energy than you've ever had in your life. Guaranteed. I see this every day in my counseling practice and people I work with and people who are reading the book. I guarantee it. But you got to do the fucking work. You got to finally stop running from that tidal wave of all the shit from your past. Yeah, it's scary, but if you do it, I guarantee you'll have the results, but you have to be willing to go down deep and address the real shit. Well, my fine people, to those of you who are celebrating Passover this weekend, uh, this week, these 10 days, I believe it is, uh, happy Pashok to you, uh, to the Christians celebrating Easter. Uh, I wish you a blessed Easter. To the Orthodox Christians celebrating uh, Palm Sunday this weekend, I wish you a happy Palm Sunday. <coughs> Excuse me. To the atheists uh, who acknowledge the significance of the vernal equinox, the movement from darkness to light, from winter, the winter of the soul to the spring and the new life rising up. To those of you who are stepping out of bondage of uh, heavy relationships or being laden with uh, emotionally charged, negative emotional charged memories from your past, from anyone stepping out of the winter of the soul into new light, I, I send love and I send warmth. And I implore you to just continue to do the work. Ah, by the way, um, I'm doing, uh, my producers and I are doing a taping uh, next Saturday, I believe. Uh, it's not in stone, but likely next Saturday morning, we'll be doing a taping, a couple of shows of uh, the Badass Counseling Show. If you would like to be on uh, the Badass Counseling Show podcast where I'm counseling you, you need to write in to the producers um, and my producers go through and one paragraph, don't write more cause they'll skip right over it. There's just so many that we get. We're going to have an upcoming episode on, uh, issues with family. We're also having one on uh, failure to launch. And we're also having one coming up on motivation. If you're, especially if you're young and can't get motivated or feel demotivated or you, ha you know what you want, but you can't sustain the motivation. Motivation is going to be a big issue. If you want to be on the show and uh, talk with me right into uh, the Badass Counseling Show podcast at production at badasscounseling.com. Um, again, it's production at badasscounseling.com. It's backwards. Is this better? Do I have to invert it like in a mirror? Is that... Somebody give me a heads up, yes or no. Is this better this way? Is it backwards now? Which way is backwards? Is this backwards? Somebody tell me. Put, shoot me in the head. Put me out of my misery. All right. Uh, okay, it's better. Now is backwards or now is... Oh, this is better. Okay, that's what I thought. Sorry for being a dipshit. Um, anyway, write into production at badasscounseling.com. Uh, if you want to be on the show, just... Um, one paragraph, don't write any more than that, all right? Just one paragraph explaining what you're struggling with. Again, we have shows coming up on dealing with family issues, um, failure to launch, but especially a motivation issue, especially if you're young. Um, and so, zippity zip, that's that. You guys, as always, I love you. You know that. Uh, I really appreciate all your great questions. Um, and uh, I hope the sun is shining where you are, or at the very least, I hope it's one of those nice kind of rainy days. I hope you're doing the work uh, to heal yourself, to clear out your own love cup. 
of all the crud and heal that hole in the bottom of your love cup. If you need help, uh, best tool that I know of, forgive me, I'm a little biased, but there's a hole in my love cup. You can get it at badasscounseling.com. And just for the record, so that you know, if you are an audiobook user soon, the audiobook will only be available on the website at badasscounseling.com. Uh, because we're shifting our uh, publisher of that. Um, but uh, all, all forms of it are on the uh, website, badasscounseling.com. We also have the do-it-yourself video courses and the Badass Counseling Show podcast, and it is free, 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 free. All right, guys, let's all say goodbye. Uh, good night, John boy. Good night, Elizabeth. All 